Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to introduce Angela Violi today. We've known each other a very long time. Uh, early days uh, working on fuel problems and fire safety when she was at Utah. As I'm sure many of you know, she's a professor at the University of Michigan now and uh, moved there in 2006. And uh, I bet you don't know very much about all of her titles. She is a, a professor in bioe and in chemi and in molecular sciences and engineering and applied physics and biophysics. That is an extremely impressive list across a very wide range of subject matter and much of it aided by the kind of computational work that Angela does. She's received a number of awards over her career. The most uh, recent is a appointment in 2019 as a combustion fellow in the International Combustion Institute. But those include a number of others, starting with an NSF Career Award in 2006, uh, 2007, followed by uh, the uh, uh, Adult Seraphim Award in 2017, and something called Blue Sky, which is a very special program at University of Michigan for looking forward. Her uh, award in that area is with Volker Seek at University of Michigan. Her computational work, as you'll see, is extremely important in understanding atomic level issues that affect macroscopic issues. And so the soot problem, much like turbulent combustion in applied systems, is a multi-scale problem. And the small scale in soot issues is as important as is the very small scale in turbulent combustion problems. And so I think you're going to find these lectures very interesting. I believe that soot is one of those issues that is not going to go away as an important one. It's not only the particle and the carbon containment itself, which is minor in terms of efficiency, but it's what's on the carbon particles and their size that relate to very important health problems. So with that, it's a pleasure to have you here. And I'm sure everybody's looking forward to your lectures. The first break will be at 3, and there'll be a, another break at 4.15. And I'm going to apologize and leave <laughs> because I want to learn something about laser diagnostics. <laughs> I, I've learned no a lot offense about taken. from Angela before yeah. and about chemical kinetics from Henry and from others speaking here. And I want to learn a little bit about laser diagnostics since I'm an experimentalist. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy. Well, good afternoon. Is it working, right? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so um, it's my first time. And um, I didn't know exactly how to plan this lecture. So uh, you bear with me. And uh, if you have any questions, all this, let me know. But I thought um, before we start, I think we should, um, I want to tell you a little bit about me. Um, something that goes a little bit beyond uh, what uh, Professor Dreyer said. Also because you guys are here from a PhD. And so I think um, something about maybe what happened in life and maybe the choices you make could be interesting. Um, also because I think you guys are in the, one of the most important moments if you want in your life. You are really deciding your academic future. So um, it's so exciting. So I was born in Italy and uh, I got my PhD in Italy. And my PhD actually was uh, in uh, combustion. Not that I was very much interested in combustion when I started. So my undergraduate, my master was in uh, polymers. And, uh, and then um, I found combustion, I will say serendipity, but um, honestly was more like a boyfriend choice. 
And so um, not very much interested in combustion. So um, that was the beginning. And, um, and then eventually I finished my PhD there, finished with the boyfriend too. And uh, um, there was a, a professor that was looking for a postdoc in the United States. And so I come from uh, Naples, that is in the south of Italy. And uh, um, it's not that easy to find people who usually leave. And uh, um, um, so there was um, a rare things to do. But I came to the United States, and the professor was uh, Professor Sarofim. And uh, he is one of you know, the most important, I would say, names in combustion, at least for the suit formation. Um, he was very much into coal combustion also. So I was very lucky. It was supposed to be an experience of a year, but uh, you know, um, I never went back, basically. And so um, we went to Utah. So I ended up in Utah in Salt Lake City. And um, just the reason why I'm telling you this story is because uh, um, I think it's important, as I'll show you also later in the slides, to be a little bit open-minded about what you want to do. And don't always do what you are doing, and thinking that your tool is the only thing you have. So I was coming from combustion. I was coming from uh, um, a PhD in which I was doing experiments. I was basically sampling a flame um, with um, trying to understand the chemical composition. So it was a, a probe in a very simple premix laminar flames. And the idea was what species are formed? Once I change the fuel, what's happening? So that's what I knew a little bit. And then I ended up in Utah and they had this a huge um, DOE center, um, ASCII center. Um, called C-SAFE. So it was the Center for Accidental Fires and uh, Explosions. So, you know, like at the beginning, you really, uh, it's kind of scary because you don't know where you fit in that thing, so you know very little. But um, that was a great experience. So the role was uh, to look at the explosion. And so, for example, when a plane crashes and you have the tank that is full of uh, high energy um, fuel, how long it takes, for example, for the tank to explode, and how violent is the explosion. So in this picture, uh, soot was important because if you have a fire, you produce a soot, soot will deposit on the tank, and so there will be all the materials, there will be the layer deposition, there will be the heat transfer, and the heat that goes into the chemistry of the fuel in the tank. So it was, um, if you want, a fascinating multi-scale and multidisciplinary problem. And so I started working with people and I didn't know anything about. Um, there was people in material science, there was people in chemistry, uh, theoretical chemist, and of course in computer science and other things. And so um, I think that was a great experience for me because uh, one of the things that I really like is the ability to be interdisciplinary. So be able to talk with different people. So different background. Um, and so, the tool I'm going to describe between today and tomorrow, I see uh, powerful for that. Because I'll show you that you can apply to combustion, but as the, also if you want to interest, for example, in biological system, you can do the same things. So this ability to be, you know, to go across discipline and uh, um, to be interested in talking with other people, I think it's very important, honestly, in, uh, um, in, in this field also. So, C-SAFE, Utah, and uh, um, I had fun. I got to know chemistry people. I learned about some computational method um, that I didn't know anything about before, um, but I thought they were really interesting. And, um, and then I moved to Michigan, in which I became an assistant professor, and then you are on your own at that point. So whatever I learned, that was what I had. And so um, what I've been working on over the last years is uh, molecular um, tools that I'll show you, applied to combustion, but also uh, to biological systems. And the idea to translate to biological system is uh, the interest in trying to see what are the product of combustion and what could be the health effect. So this is a little bit of my history. And uh, um, as I was mentioning, this is the first time here. So I didn't know exactly how to do this. So I'll show you the agenda that I put together. But then I was thinking, you guys, you know, now you're listening to me and it's after lunch. So instead of me vomiting stuff on you as soon as we start, 
Um, I think it will be maybe take, I would like to take five minutes just to learn a little bit about you. I know there are two other sessions in parallel, so you guys might have an interest in, in chemistry a little bit or in fuels or combustion, I hope, unless you're in the wrong room. And so it would be nice to um, learn a little bit about you. So what I'm going to ask you first before, after lunch, is let's do, um, let's guess something first of all and then we'll talk. So, um, I was hoping you guys can maybe form groups of five people. If you can, just turn around, whatever is around you. I don't know how many people you know that. And then, each group is going to answer this question for me right now, okay? So, what I would like to know, I would like each, I would like one answer for each group. I would like you to tell me what do you think is the percentage of those people? And what I'm asking is, looking at the audience, I know you guys just met, or maybe you arrived yesterday or day, so you get to know each other at this point. So I think it's nice if we can just uh, break the ice here for a few minutes. And so, I would like an estimate. How many people do you think, I think in this audience, because I don't know about the other rooms, are coming, are national, are coming from US institution? How many outside and how many from Europe? So what I'm going to do is that each group can give me an answer. Possibly if you can write, I can save it. And then the group that gets the closest to this percentage um, will get a little token. I will ask Professor Law, that is not here, so he doesn't know yet, to um, kind of give a little token to the group that is winning. Okay? So why don't we take five minutes and you tell me what you think about this. Find someone, it's okay, it's just to have a few minutes to... Done. Okay, so finally, there was supposed to be an easy question, and then we have... 60. You want the percentages now? How much do we have? So we have 60 plus 15 plus 7. So 60, 15, and 7. Okay. Okay, so we'll see later who is winning this. But so far we have, oh. Okay, US, how many do you think? Done? It's close enough. <laughs> okay, so we have 73% is US. Um, outside US is 18, and Europe is 8. <laughs> what, what, what's going on? What's the question here? Okay. Fine. Okay, that was supposed to be an easy question. It was more complicated than I thought. Okay, so did anybody get close to those numbers? You think so? Okay, we'll see what happens. I'll let you know tomorrow when I convince Professor Law to give a present. Okay, so let's get now to the more serious stuff. So I want to tell you that I'm not going to do this math because... Um, <laughs> Um, I'm not that good, let's put it this way. But um, the intent for me for these uh, uh, lectures was more to give you a glimpse of things. You can read the papers, you can learn. But it's more like to, um, if you want, give you an opportunity to think and decide what is you want to do next, okay? Just to show what people are doing and didn't differently. So it's just your curiosity. I'm not supposed to give you all those details because you will not listen to me anyway. So I'm going to say this is what I was thinking. So I was asked to talk about suit modeling. So the way I decided to break down the material is that today I would like to give you a little bit of uh, uh, background. So what are we talking about exactly? And um, what are the limitations? Why there is so many problems here? No, we don't tell them. Tomorrow instead um, I want to dive into the computational tools. Again, not with that amount of math, but uh, um, 
showing just the potential of things. Actually, I was just at a conference at the Mediterranean Symposium. I gave my plenary, and I got some people in the back. They told me that I put too much math in my presentation. So um, no math here, so for nothing. Wednesday, the last day, I will tell you how I've been using these models, what are the applications, and uh, what are also the open questions that are left in this area. So, um, are you guys here mainly, do you have an interest in the chemistry? Do you have an interest in, in engines? What is driving you to, you know, to this, especially this area, this topic here, with the summer seven? Are you more interested in suit modeling? Are you more interested in, uh, um, what, what is that you are interested in at this point? In the chemistry, okay. For the formation of suit and nanoparticle, great. Anybody else? I'm interested about uh, engine output and try to minimize the heat. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Anyone else who wants to talk about yeah? Suit modeling in the context of larger incubation. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so very small chemistry goes into the fluid dynamics, right? And you have a. Uh, uh, Dr. Chen is coming after me, so you will see the chemistry here and then. There's all good points. Okay, so let's start from the fundamentals and then um, let's see where we can get to. So this is a cartoon that I usually I show and I like it. Um, it was the first time uh, was the, done by uh, Professor Bokhorn um, and in 1994. So it was one of the books I used to read during my PhD and um, I still think that it's very useful. Um, it's a way to represent the different processes. So what you see here is uh, if you think about uh, uh, maybe a candle, something very simple. So think about the candle. The candle, what happened? You are going to burn the wax, right? So you're going from a simple fuel, that's a paraffin usually in a wax, that has maybe nine carbons, a C9 is a paraffin, all the way to a series of chemistry and physics and then lead you to the formation is a black material that eventually, if you take the candle close to the wall, is uh, the black material formed by millions and millions of compounds with the car a lot of uh, carbon atoms. So somehow you go through these uh, processes that go from a few carbon atoms to million of carbon atoms. And so our current understanding of the processes is along this line. So I can't see that, so I have to look here, so sorry about that. Um, so starting from a simple fuel, the base, and you have a fuel and an oxidant usually, what happens is that you slowly form some gas phase species. And so here in the picture you have some CO, CO2, some radicals, so H. Eventually they grow into um, carbonaceous material. And so in the gas phase, you look at the formation of benzene, other aromatics, pyrene is a four member rings, four, six member rings, and then uh, still gas phase chemistry. Now, this is the first step, uh, usually when you want to talk about in and suit modeling. So you go from the fuel and eventually you start building this material. This is the gas phase chemistry and the formation of those, uh, what they call pHs, so polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, something like the four rings that you see here, basically, okay? Eventually, somehow, there is this transition, this mysterious transition that goes from gas phase, you start having a lot of particles here. So still, um, gas phase chemistry eventually turns into particles dynamic. And this transition region is uh, um, still one of the least understood stage in the suit formation. So you start growing eventually, and what happens is that you start forming those uh, small particles, actually they are nanoparticles, and the process is called the inception or nucleation. Eventually they grow, they grow, until you start seeing these first uh, small nanoparticles, that is maybe one, two nanometers. Once you have this, these are still in the gas phase. So you're having like a heterogeneous um, nucleation, gas phase and solid particles together. And so um, they start um, growing by um, coagulation. And we'll talk a little bit about this. But while they are coagulating, they are also, you have gas phase species that are added to the surface of the particles. And then eventually the agglomeration continues and you have different process like the oxidation and carbonization. You end up with this black material that is again the suit that comes out. 
So this is a very much a cartoon, and what you see is that all those uh, transitions, especially those particles, are all spheres. But what I'll show you eventually over the next couple of days also is that there is much more to that than a single sphere, but there is a lot of chemistry going on. And if you're interested in talking about uh, mm, models, for example, even for nanoparticle formation or for soot formation, you are interested very much in the particle size distribution. So you need to know once in a certain condition what kind of uh, material you form. Once you know that, you can also take into account about, you know, talk about the health, for example. So you have a nanoparticle that you come out of an engine, you breathe that, what kind of damage does a nanoparticle do? Or if you want to talk about emissions, you need to know something about the chemistry and the physics of those particles. Because, uh, for example, if you um, want to know something about the interaction of this nanoparticle with radiation, incoming radiation, sun radiation, you need to know the structures. So what drove me to look for different approaches was was need for structures. So I was very much interested in understanding how the things are growing and not just say that is a sphere. So from this one, my summary is that the suit formation, and we will talk about this, so this is the first part of the presentation today, you have four major processes. Once you have the right gas phase, what happens is you have an homogeneous nucleation, so those gas phase get together. Then you have a particle coagulation, particle surface reaction because they are in a gas phase chemistry and then particle agglomeration to further grow into the bigger compound. So those are all different processes and some of those they have phenomenological equation that describe them and uh, other things is that we are trying to get some more um, insight. So let's talk about the particles precursors first. Um, there has been a lot of proposal for compounds in the literature um, about the nature of this inception and is a still, as I mentioned, something that is not clear. But, but um, one of the points that has helped us in uh, the discussion is that uh, gas phase species like this, like uh, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, are really the precursors. You need to form them to get to nanoparticles and soot. Okay? So if you don't have them, you will not have the, um, the nanoparticle or the soot. So the first thing that was important is that soot particles comes from uh, the this, um, st uh, reactions and those formation of those products. So already this one tells you that if you don't get this right, everything that comes after, it's not right, okay? Or as an error, basically. So just to summarize what I said is that uh, we have two major topics that we're going to cover today briefly. And I know that my slides might not be following exactly what I'm saying here. They will, but there will be something a little bit different. So my apologies for that. But I'm not, the material is the basically similar, the, the content. So I'm going to say it's gas phase chemistry, and we'll talk about the formation of aromatics and the growth of aromatics, so how you form those pHs, and eventually something about the particle dynamics, how do they form, and what are the current mechanisms. So before getting into the gas phase chemistry, I decided I wanted to briefly talk a little bit about fuels, because you have the fuel. The first thing that you see is a fuel, right? So by definition, what is a fuel? A fuel, um, there is a big difference between what you do in a lab and what is real life somehow. So let's go, uh, let's build on complexity here. So the fuels, uh, so is um, um, a compound that basically releases energy via chemical reactions. Okay, so this is a pretty good definition of the fuel. And each fuel undergoes different reaction with different rates. So just driving the point that chemistry is important. Sometimes, most of the times, uh, especially when I'm in mechanical engineering, uh, when I use chemistry, or I, uh, you know, I propose a class with the chemistry, the attendance is almost zero. And so is the chemistry, here I just want to make the point that chemistry is important. And um, you don't need to be um, you know, an expert in, in chemistry, but I think there is a little understanding that we owe to each other for, and for combustion. And so don't be, you know, don't get um, scared away or turned down by the chemistry. Uh, it's not boring as it looks like, but it's important in this case. Especially because, and I think this is an important point, one of the, um, I will say, um, novelty or more interesting uh, um, frontiers in combustion is the ability to predict. 
So what uh, different people are trying to do right now is not only to model a combustion system, but also to predict it. And so in order to become predictive, you need to be um, robust enough um, that given a fuel, for example, you can um, predict what's going on to happen. Okay? So you are not just taking an experimental data and see if your model matches. You're becoming before. You're saying, yeah, my model can predict actually what will be the experiment. There is a huge drive in this direction because, it's, uh, um, because of the cost, first of all, of running experiments, the time. And um, somehow the need to be predictive or the ability to be predictive can also make you um, more interested in developing new things. Okay? So for example, um, with the atomistic method that I'm going to show you, I link the structures of the fuel to some kind of product that are formed. And so think about that. You can also do the reverse pathway and you can say, this is what I want. What kind of fuel do I need to do that? Okay? So predictive means also going backwards in, this, in these questions, basically. So, but what are those fuels? When you go to a lab, you use ethylene, you use acetylene, something very, very simple, but what about the real fuels? That's what we want to ask. If you run an engine um, and you're looking, for example, at transportation fuel, then things are a little bit different. And so I want to take a few minutes in this presentation to talk a little bit about the real fuel transportation and how do we get to the cartoon that I showed you before, okay? So, oh, I'm having a <laughs> pain in my neck. With it. Okay, so the real fuel. Real fuel is basically, um, they're composed of a lot of species. And so here I'm going to uh, show you um, differences between the diesel fuel, the jet fuel, and the gasoline fuel. And so what you see is that, again, chemistry a little bit, but the percentage, for example, of aromatic and uh, alkanes or isoalkane is different depending on the fuel that you're using. Whether you're running a diesel engine or a jet fuel for transportation, for uh, uh, jet, for uh, airplanes, or the gasoline fuels. Now, why this is important is because in order to get to the cartoon that I show you at the beginning, I need to know what my fuel is. And if I want a model, there is no way I can do the chemistry of hundreds of compounds, okay? So I need to find a simplification for this problem. And so here comes one of the main concepts in combustion, especially the chemistry of the fuel, it is a surrogate. Um, the surrogate is basically a mixture of one or more compounds that represent some of the property that you're interested in. Okay, so when I was in Utah, for example, I was I mentioned before, and was this a C-safe center, it was accidental explosions. So they were not interested in an engine, for example, but they want to know real fuel for an explosion. What kind of property do I need to model that? And as you can th think about, the fuel and an engine, I will need a different property. So in an engine, for example, I want to match the ignition delay, in a fire and explosion, there is no ignition delay, okay? So the properties are completely different. You do your optimization of the surrogate based on the system you want to model. And so, why they are necessary? So the first one is because, again, I was mentioning there are molecules in the real fuel in their composition, and you cannot identify all of them also. So it's very, um, it, it's not possible. The information is not available. So think about, you know, your compound, your jet fuel as um, some weird, alkane and there is no chemistry available, you cannot model that, okay? So you need to simplify the system. And then computational time will be very long when all the species are included simulated. If you could, that would be impossible. So what do we do here? If I have a real transportation fuel, I cannot go directly to a CFD simulation, okay? But with a detailed combustion. So what I'm going to do is talk about fuel surrogate always. And so model the fuel that emulates some of the property that you are interested and uh, the composition of hydrocarbons um, that you want to uh, study with the reactions. So the pathway is going to be this way instead of there is no way it could be that. Okay? And maybe to answer your question before, even to go from here here, I need to reduce my chemistry a lot. Otherwise, uh, um, so not only I go here, then I go to the surrogate, and once I'm here, I need additional steps before I get in my CFD, okay? because they cannot handle a lot of chemistry. But that is uh, f at least the first step for uh, um, a lot of the devices. Okay, so question for you guys. 
work. I'm not going to do the work by myself today. So what process are we interested in? So I have an example here. You tell me what you think. This is a gasoline engine. Okay, some of you are familiar with that. Um, usually, you guys, you know how the gasoline engine works? Everybody knows that, right? So um, you have uh, the air and the fuel from the beginning in the cylinder, then you have a compression, the cylinder, the cylinder is going up, it's compressing, and then eventually there is a spark, right? So this system is uh, usually runs with the fee and equivalence ratio one premix chart. Um, there is a spark plug that I was talking about, and the problem with gasoline, as you might know, is the knocking. So basically is that the, the combustion can start before the cylinder, the piston reach the top dead center, okay? And you don't want that because you want the efficiency, the highest possible efficiency. So work out of the system should be the highest. And is the highest when the piston is at the top dead center. If the combustion starts before, the amount of workout is less. Basically, that's what it is. Okay, so these are the characteristics that an engine has. So it's almost stoichiometric is a spark ignition, there's a flame propagation, so once you start the spark, and then there are knock issues uh, because of the direct fuel injection also, okay? So the question for you is, thinking about combustion properties, so simplified combustion property, physics or chemistry, what kind of properties do you think are important for the system? So you have to develop a surrogate for this fuel, what property do you want to match? You cannot match everything. So you have to say, my real fuel, I measure something in my real fuel, I'm going to measure my surrogate, what property do you want to match? What do you think? Ignition delay. delay. Anything else? Octane number. Octane number, I like that. What else? Heat release. Heat release, okay. What do you guys say? Oh my gosh, well, don't you, okay. Remember that the more things you match, the more you are optimizer. This is an optimization process, okay? So you cut it out. Anything else? The of okay, so the TSI, yeah, the threshold, threshold. Okay, those are all good tests. So according to the system, listen, let's see, let's see what I have here. Okay, so some of the things that we want to measure, as you were saying, also the ignition delay, and some of you also were mentioning the run and the moon. So, Laminar flame speed is something that you're interested in the system. Hydrogen carbon ratio, something to tell you a little bit uh, about soot also. So somehow it's related to that. Uh, Ron and Mon, you guys were talking about this, ignition delay, so the octane number. Uh, volatility and density of those systems are also very interesting. Now, what I wanted to mention is that those are more physical properties, that we call, but instead the hydrogen carbon ratio is more the chemistry and ignition delay as well. So, what predominantly the gas phase process, so gas phase chemical properties and combustion behaviors are important. So, gas phase chemistry and some of the combustion uh, properties, okay, for the system. What happened here? So diesel, diesel is different. Different as you know, the diesel basically you have air from the beginning. Now this, the piston goes up to the, top that, uh, to the top that center and then there is an injector. The fuel is added to the system, right? And uh, um, so the, the fuel injector, so there's a spray. So there is a liquid, the fuel spray. And there is a, um, a stratified charge. So the fuel goes from lean to rich, basically. So the system is different now. So direct fuel injection after compression of the fresh charge, for example, is a stratified air fuel mixture, auto ignition and diffusion of the system. So a little bit different. What property would you look at right now? What do you say? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What else? Ignition delay, someone said ignition delay. Ignition temperature. Okay. CT number, good. Distillation. Okay. Let's see. So here I have more, a little bit more of the physical property. So volatility, density, viscosity. Very important here. CT number, some of you mentioned that. And again, the hydrogen carburetion that somehow relate to the soot tendency. Somehow, 
yeah, the CTS side that uh, you were mentioning about. So the processes now is different. The processes are in liquid and in gas phase. Okay, so you have the liquid, you have the spray is injected, so things are changing here. And so the physical property of the liquid fuel and the gaseous combustion are important. Okay, so this was just a simple example to tell you that you need to think about the process of uh, the system you want to mention, and then you step back and decide what properties you want to match. And again, the more the property, the more difficult is the optimization process, the mathematical process. So, this is just to give you a glimpse. I, I don't want to go through all this, math, to this uh, literature, but there's a lot of people who are working on surrogates. And I think one of the first works was this one with Utah because they were doing the jet fuels. So again, we were doing the explosion of jet fuels uh, in a fire. We did also the experiments, like uh, there were some kind of desert area in which you would put the tank with the fire and there was an explosion. So that was cool, I have to say. So, but from there, there's been a lot of uh, other studies. There is uh, uh, jet fuels used in different systems. So they were talking about ignition, um, extinction was something else. And then they did for gasoline, gasoline and jet A. So they are different fuels. And again, as I show you in my example, depending on the system, you change the property that you want to match. But I want to talk for a few minutes of what I have done. So I've done the surrogate for jet fuels, so JP8. This is um, started a few years ago, actually, when I moved to Utah also. We have the TARDEC, that was the army um, based uh, in, in Michigan. And what they were interested in was jet fuels because they had this a single fuel policy. What that means is that they decide to use jet fuels in tanks. So if you go to a battle or a war field, um, the tank, was basically, uh, instead of feeding with the diesel, was feeding the, the jet fuels. And the question was, if we need to source our fuel from different places, what happened to my engine? So the question was, can you model the behavior of a diesel engine with the jet fuel um, in a kind of a, a accurate way, accurate whatever that means? Okay, and so if the, you have the jet fuel from different sources, there is a variability. And so how the parameters influence the diesel combustion was the question basically, okay? And so, um, uh, again, the, all the, the army, the ignition engine needed to go from diesel, diesel uh, fuel to the JP-8. And so there were different benefits, as I was saying, there was a kind of homeland security, so independence, so can use any type of sources for the fuel. Um, there was reduced corrosion, those are other um, uh, advantages of that, okay? But the main driving was the ability to use different sources of fuel. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about fuel. So why even this question, it's a little complicated. So we talk about jet fuels, the kerosene fuel, diesel fuel. And so to give you an idea here, kerosene versus diesel, what does that mean? It's just chemistry again. What compounds are in this fuel? Kerosene, and I don't think I have this a slide, but I don't know. Um, so the kerosene comes from petroleum and is very low viscosity, okay? And, uh, um, is still obtained from the distillation of petroleum, but the temperature is 150, in this case 275, that will be different from the diesel. And basically you have um, carbon atoms between 10 and 16. So I'm talking about a little bit of the chemistry here. Diesel is a still distillation, but is between 200 and 350. And so you have carbons that are between nine and 25, okay? So the mixture of liquid molecules is going to be different. And that means different viscosity, different chemistry that you will see in the system. So the question is, um, what happens when you burn a, a kerosene in a diesel? Just, just as, a, without calculation, just uh, like that. So the first thing that I can tell you is that kerosene has a, a, a different energy content. So you have 135,000 BTU per gallon, 139,000 uh, BTU per gallon for the diesel too, that we are talking about. Kerosene has a very little lubricity and wear in, uh, cause a lot of wear in the fuel pumps, okay? So that will be the first things. But could I mix them, for example? So even if you start with something that is different, it doesn't work, you think, uh, can you mix them? What, what do you think could be the advantages of mixing um, two of them? Any idea? 
what would you do? For example, living in Michigan, where it's really cold, we had a very bad winter last winter, could be some advantage in mixing those two? something like that. So there are two major advantages. Anything else? So one more. The fact that it has a different carbon aromaticity, so that, sorry, the, as bigger, the number of carbons is higher. So you can go to C25, for example, versus something that is lighter. What does it tell you? Something about soot, correct. So here are the two main advantages. I could mix them. So 10% of kerosene will lower the cold filter plugging by five degrees, for example. So that's very interesting, so that was a good question here. And then, of course, emissions, because if you have something that is lighter, the amount of emission soot will be uh, less than if you have something that is heavier. So this is interesting. Now, what happened here? Do you guys know that? What if you put diesel in a gasoline engine? What happened? Any idea? I'm just, so my point here with all those questions, guys, is that I want you to think a little bit about the chemistry and the physics of some of the main molecules, okay? Just, just to add. Yeah. Uh, okay, very good. What does them the do? Okay, did you guys hear that? So what he said is that it will change the octane number and the basic the ignition delay will change. So answer is, is that the gasoline is going to requires an octane rating of 8791. And so um, basically is the ability to resist knocking, right, at the octane number. And so since the diesel has an octane rating of 25 to 30, pumping diesel fuel, for example, um, can lower the octane level, okay? So basically it can also damage the gas mixture. So the ignition will change in the system. So what happened is that the fuel, the injectors um, in your engine would inject the diesel fuel into the engine cylinders, if you want, but the spark plugs will fire, but nothing will happen, okay? Because basically the, the ignition has changed for that. And so you have nothing to ignite. And so usually they estimate that 10% of diesel contamination uh, lowers the octane by five points, okay? So, Usually this does not happen because when you go to the gas station, you cannot put the nozzle of the gasoline into the diesel, whatever. Um, at least for the cars that have been produced over the last 25 years, this doesn't happen. So you, you, but it's just good to know. And also there are trucks and motorcycles that don't have this kind of a plate, they put a gas cap. So that could happen to them, basically. Um, what if you now you put the gasoline in the diesel? So the other thing that is going to happen is that the gasoline will uh, depress the flash temperature. Okay, so what that means is that 1% of gasoline will lower the diesel flash point by 18 Celsius degree. And so the diesel will ignite in the engine and so that can lead to the engine damage. Okay. It can also, um, the gasoline contamination will affect the fuel pump. So those are very, um, just a few examples that I wanted to show you because even without talking about the chemistry here at this point, just thinking about the chemical composition or some of the physical property of those molecules can tell you something about the behavior in an engine. Now, if you look at hydrocarbon distribution, I'm showing here um, jet fuels. Okay, so an IPK is a fuel, is a isoparaffinic kerosene uh, obtained from coal. Uh, jet A is a jet fuel again. NS8 is basically from natural gas. Okay, so those are three different fuels, synthetic, natural jet fuels. And um, this is a sum of those that we started to answer the question from the army. Okay, so jet fuels with different sources, for example. And so what you see is that even, they are all jet fuels, but the distribution of species is different. And so you go from uh, the, um, the IPK that has a huge percentage of the isolcane all the way to JET-A with the different distributions, okay? And so the point is that um, even those two between the S8 and IPK, they have isolcane that are similar, look at that, but the cetane number 
it's completely different. So the problem is a little bit complex, okay? If you look at some of the species, you don't have the whole picture. So isolcane distribution is a similar, but the CTA number is different. It's dramatically different. So you can go, usually in an engine diesel, you have around 56, this is a number here. If you use the IPK, it's a single jet fuels, similar distribution, but now the CTA number is 25, okay? And so the question again is, can you predict what happens with the system? <coughs> And so here I'm just showing you example. This is the linear cane, because what I mean by isol cane and normal cane for you is basically something that is a chain or you have some branching here um, um, in the system. And the branching will affect the chemistry. The chemistry will give you a different CTA number here. Too, okay? So you can go for something that is a 14.6, that's a CTA number from uh, the isol cane to 52.6 or 57.6, okay? So just a little complexity here. Okay, so here is what we have done. We have looking at this surrogate formulation, the methodology, and uh, we uh, develop a, a surrogate optimizer. What, what does, what the surrogate do basically is to find a composition that matches various properties. So the question for us is what property do we want to match? Remember the example I gave you for the design. So the target property that we decided to get for this work was basically target property. We did the CTA number, we look at the uh, lower heating value, hydrogen carbon ratio and the molecular weight. That was like our chemical information that we want to preserve. And then in terms of physical property, density, viscosity, surface tension and distillation characteristics. So we put all these together and we decide to study this, optimize the process and see if we can come up with a distribution of four or five compounds that could represent and match all those properties. And we did this for some target fuel that were jet A and IPK and S8, the one I just showed you. So I have a different chemical distribution and I want to match all those properties. So the surrogate is basically, um, you start from the uh, components, you, you have to pick. You pick some uh, species from the major classes that you saw and then you um, guess at some composition of course, then you compute the mixture properties and then you run through the optimizer. If it matches, you're good to go. Otherwise, you have to iterate until you find the, um, an answer with a decent error, a discrepancy. So, that. so all this brought us to this um, problem, to this um, result, basically. So um, we were able to, uh, for different jet fuels, for different jet fuels, so jet A, IPK, and S8, we use only four compounds. And in doing so, we pick them um, in a good way, I think. So that, and so what happened is that we were able to match um, uh, the property that I was mentioning before. So we had, for some of those four, six, so we had a six component surrogate palette. So with six compounds, we were able to cover the three jet fuels and we were able to match different uh, properties, so chemical and physical properties. Not only that, but we match them as a function of the temperature. Remember in the system, the temperature is changing. So we were not taking only the average temperature, but we were looking at the temperature dependence. And here is just an example of the results of that. And so um, what you see is a function of the temperature and you see, for example, the top is the density, that's the viscosity is in the middle and the, the um, specific heat is at the bottom. So what you see is the comparison between the real fuel and the, our surrogate for those, the corresponding alcohol. And actually the agreement is pretty good, also as a function of the temperature. The choice of property is very, very important because here what I'm showing is that the surrogate will change dramatically according to what property you're interested in. And so the chemical and physical property, if I have all eight target properties I was mentioning is something here. If I only choose the chemical property like the CTA number, lower eating value, I have something that looks like this, okay? And so again, if you wanna talk about diesel engine, you need something about the liquid viscosity because they have a spray coming in, right? So the physical property needs to play a role. Um, and so combining chemistry physics is important. It is also um, kind of a unique approach to do that. What can we do? 
you know, great, you have this um, surrogate, what, what do you do with this surrogate? So the first thing that we could do is that you now have, for example, four compounds, assuming that you have some chemistry for that, you can start maybe plugging in into CFD code. And here I'm just showing you an example of a simulation that we did in which there was the uh, liquid injection basically. And what you see is uh, the penetration, for example, you start seeing uh, over time how far this spray is injected, what is the temperature, and so you can start, you see, a completely different behavior between S8 and JET-A. And so even with the four species of the surrogate, we were able to distinguish between those two fuels. If you remember, they had different CT numbers too, so the behavior was different in the engine. So, to summarize this, um, the surrogate. The surrogate are a simple hydrocarbon mixture that mimics some of the property of the combustion behavior of the fuels that you're interested in. You need to target also the systems. The surrogate enables the combustion of real transportation fuel. That is something you cannot do directly. So you need to simplify your systems. And there are different and important aspects of the surrogate. So one is the property that you are interested in, and I show you the example between the gasoline and the diesel. Um, the selection of the surrogate is important. So what species are you starting from? You know, is it dodecane? Um, is it isoctane? So they have different property. I also show you that if it's a linear or if it has a branch, the CT number changes a lot between the system. And so finally, the um, you need to make sure that there is a chemical mechanism available, otherwise you cannot model. And the cost, it's uh, affordable in all this. So one of the problems we ran into when we were doing this, this, the experiments was that, you know, you need to buy these uh, compounds to, make, to do some experiments that compare with the real fuel. Some of the choices we made in the past were very expensive, for example. So cost, I think, is another variable that needs to go into this optimization. So I think here I'm going to stop for the surrogate and uh, um, I think it's also the time for a break and we can start in 15 minutes with more chemistry.